Hello, I'm very glad to be here today to talk to you a little bit about my career experiences as part of the Lunch and Learn uh, series by the uh, IEEE Photonic Society, and I want to thank you for your uh, attending today. I'll start by giving you a little outline of my talk, and I decided on a graphical outline. I'm going to take you through my career. I'm going to start out at the bachelor's degree uh, and move through uh, different aspects of my career which encompass both uh, government, industry, and academia. So it all started at Caltech, where I did my undergraduate work. So I'll start telling you what it was like uh, at that time. So here we have a nice photo of the Millikan uh, Library and the beautiful reflecting plant, uh, pond in front of it at Caltech. And uh, the uh, very nice olive walk here leading up to the faculty club at the Athenaeum. It's a very beautiful campus at Caltech. So at Caltech, women undergraduates were admitted for the first time in the fall of 1970. And in 1973, the first graduating class, there were four uh, women graduating. So I arrived at Caltech in 1980. Uh, in fact, you can see me here uh, riding an elephant down the olive walk. Someone decided that uh, Einstein said, uh, let there be elephants. And for Einstein's birthday that year, uh, we celebrated uh, uh, on the olive walk. In any case, what I would try to tell you about is what the environment was like for a woman in science and engineering at uh, this point in time. Um, I can tell you that when I was there, there were 10% women, maybe, maybe 10%, probably a little bit less. It got better. It depends on how you measured it. And uh, I have to say, I consider myself to be very lucky that I was born at the right time because I don't think I was the kind to go pick it and insist on being one of the first uh, students at Caltech. Uh, for me, the path had already been open, and, and I uh, uh, realized that that had a big impact on my life, the fact that this opportunity was uh, open to me. While I was there, uh, they were still adapting to women students, and I guess I'm going to talk about more about the students at Caltech, not the administration, but what the environment was for students to come in uh, into this changing uh, environment. So there's a school newspaper called the California Tech, it would come out every uh, couple weeks, and they had a special issue once a year, which was called the Hot Throbbing Rivet, and the Hot Throbbing Rivet would have a centerfold. And so in uh, May 1979, a couple of the women students wrote a letter to the uh, school newspaper and asked that this year, from now on, we skip having uh, the centerfold. And they gave various reasons for why they considered it to be sexist. Of course, the um, student editors came back gave the explanation that uh, the fact that people told sexual jokes at dinner parties with uh, men and women attending was just proof that the men accepted the women and that they were willing to share with them these sexual jokes they like to tell. And uh, also they said that uh, they didn't think that having a, a naked woman in the centerfold was anything uh, disrespectful for the women and that their solution was that in this year they would have both a male and a female centerfold uh, for the hot throbbing rivet. Needless to say, the conclusion of this little skirmish over the hot throbbing rivet was that there was no school newspaper <laughs> from 1979 to 1980. And as far as I know, following that date, there were no more centerfolds. I'm trying to understand the environment there, uh, this cartoon, which was published in the Caltech uh, paper, it's uh, one of the issues, I'm not sure which one, sort of shows you what the, the male students at Caltech felt like. Um, they felt like they were uh, going into a monastery and that there were no women and that they were the ones who were uh, in sort of dire straits and that the women were being a little unreasonable. Here is uh, the last issue of the California Tech uh, the school newspaper right before uh, it was banned for a year. And we can see here at the masthead, they were talking about the hot throbbing controversy, which is going on at the time. But I, I just bring this up because I want to show you what the, the main uh, lead article was about, the statistics for the class of 83. And if you read in, they say, now the good news. It contains 36 women, an all-time record. 
So, you know, the students, they wanted to have women there. The administration, they wanted to have women there. They were doing what they could to make it happen, but it wasn't easy. And uh, these changes that were going on at the time um, may be hard to imagine now when I think uh, things are a little, a little more accepted for women in the workplace, but uh, it was something uh, to experience at the time. So that takes me out of my uh, bachelor's degree and now I'll talk to you about the next step. But actually the next step isn't even on my outline. It's sort of the part that doesn't make it into a CV necessarily. And, and I'm going to call this, uh, you know, the idea of a gap here, which is a very modern interpretation. Or some people may say that I had to sow my wild oats. But in any case, I spent a couple of years uh, not really advancing my career so directly. So I call them the wandering years, and I went to Kingston, Jamaica. I taught at the College of Art, Sciences, and Technology there. I was teaching digital logic to undergraduates. I read a continuing education class to telecommunications technicians. And mostly I learned a lot about diversity, and I learned a lot about different worldviews. And uh, it was very important for my uh, personal growth at that time. After a couple of years in Kingston, I moved on to living a couple of years in Quito, Ecuador. And in Quito, Ecuador, I was teaching uh, Wayne Computer Systems to some local USAID employees. And in that experiment, uh, experience, I learned uh, some Spanish, and I learned how to play tennis at 2,850 meters, which, believe me, is not so obvious. But I had a great time, met a lot of great people, uh, and again, you know, a lot of personal growth. So now I'll get sort of back on the charts. Uh, having uh, spent those few years traveling abroad, I uh, decided to go back to being an adult. And as an adult, I took a position uh, as a project management engineer in government at the Department of Defense at the Pentagon. So this was a, a position where I would run telecommunication projects of all kinds of different sorts. And my role was basically to bridge the gap between the end users of equipment and the government contractors who would have to uh, design systems to meet uh, these end user, end user needs. And it was mostly wireless projects, although there were some optical communications at that point as well. And it was a group where money was really no object. Well, that's exaggerating a little, but let's just say that uh, these weren't mass communications devices. These were special um, devices for special requirements, and uh, it was uh, quite exciting to be able to work with uh, coming up with new new devices. I was the first woman engineer hired in that group, and I think again this is a case where they were very motivated, very much trying to seek out a female engineer to bring them diversity that they, they felt they needed. Um, but the interview took some unusual turns because this was still something new for them. Um, I can tell you that we've been going through the interval interview, talking about my qualifications, uh, my um, education at Caltech, my credentials. Oh, that was that was fine, but there was still something wasn't quite working. And so we started talking, and I mentioned that I had this 1967 Dodge Dart, and. Uh, not sure how it came up. I brought it up and I was talking about, oh yeah, this old car of mine. I probably push started it as much as I ever started it uh, uh, with the uh, ignition working. And as part of that, you know, I'm, I've never been a big fan of cars, but I was very broke. And I didn't have much money and I had this old car. Going to school in California, you really needed a car. And uh, so I explained to them that I took a course in the local community college in Pasadena, and I learned how to do some of the auto mechanics myself to save money. In fact, I, I had to change the clutch of the car, and I had to take the head out of the engine, take it out, get it refurbished, put it back in the car. And you could feel the tension in the room during that interview disappear when I told this story. And you may wonder why. It, when I said the interview took an unusual turn, you may have thought they were going to ask me if I was going to have children or what my marriage prospects were. No, 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 no. Not at all. These professionals, they were motivated. They wanted a woman. What they really wanted to know, is this person going to fit into my team? Is this person able to adapt to the difficult situations that we're encountering? Um, is she more than just, you know, a 
fairly recent graduate. And I think that this experience that I was able to convey to them was very convincing for them. I was willing literally to get dirty, <laughs> to uh, do something uh, out of my comfort zone, and uh, succeeded in, in doing it. And uh, something I um, didn't plan on going into that interview. So the government years I consider to be really a fantastic chance to travel. I have to say my main motivation in accepting that position, and I had a few options, was because I wanted to see the world. I had already traveled some, uh, and I wanted to do more. So one of the things I was, as I, I got to travel a lot, I also got to discover this unusual saying calling inside the beltway. What does inside the beltway mean? And I'll, I'll tell you. Well, first of all, Washington, D.C., they have this... Um, interstate, which goes all the way around the city and can help you avoid going through the city, and that's called the Beltway. But inside the Beltway, what that means is it's the mentality of government officials. So uh, inside of the Beltway is where all of the government officials live, and outside the Beltway is where all of the government employees live. And so you can see here in our a little cartoon that inside the Beltway has to do with sex scandals, investigations, investigations, and more investigations. Uh, so that was an education for me to uh, learn about government and how things uh, work in that environment. So that leads me to what I want to call my first lemma of the woman engineer. This is the first real lesson I learned uh, as a working woman engineer, and especially in a group of, you know, I'm not, I wasn't in the military, but I worked with people um, who, who was a very male-dominant uh, environment, and I learned that you don't have to learn to drink beer. I got there, I was a wine drinker, I didn't drink much beer, and I got there, everybody else drinking by the pitcher, and I go, okay, I'm going to fit in, I want to really succeed at this job, I want to be one of the guys, and, you know, I never liked it. And finally, a few years later, I realized I really didn't have to do that. You know, I could fit in in all kinds of different ways. And uh, um, so I'm sharing with you the benefit of my experience. So getting back to the uh, outline of my talk, after um, the years in government, I decided that I wanted to go back and do some graduate work. When I graduated from Caltech, uh, I just wanted to get out and do things and see things and just raring, raring to go. But after six months in government, I took the job because I wanted to travel. I wanted new experiences, but it wasn't challenging technically. And so uh, I decided it was time to get a little techier. And then I uh, went back uh, to graduate school and I went to uh, Princeton University for my master's and PhD. So, the return to graduate school, I had a 10-year hiatus when I had no calculus. <laughs> I can tell you my technical background was a bit rusty, had to study again for the GREs, and I dropped 10 points. That's one, one, one point per year, just to let you know. But uh, really, it was a fantastic experience, and uh, what I want to give you is the message or the takeaway from this part of uh, my career is how invigorating it was, how rejuvenating it was. You come out with a new degree and you are like a newly minted coin. Part of it is internal. It was invigorating for me. I got to try new challenges that I had put aside and I showed myself that I could do it. I, I don't know if you've maybe observed this and so far in my development, but I'm always trying to prove myself. I go to a you know high ranking, very esoteric school and then I get a job at the Pentagon. Uh, to prove that I can do both sides. That's what I wanted to do. I could fit in anywhere. Um, so, this is also, I could do graduate school. I didn't do it then. I can go back. I can do it. And uh, so exciting. Yeah. Meeting young people, uh, discussing again, being in the environment of exchanging uh, that is so unique to the university. And part of that discussion was with uh, my fellow uh, graduate students, uh, what it was like to be a woman engineer. And I was chatting with one fellow and uh, telling him, you know, how hard it was for me that, you know, I go in and I feel like everyone's watching me and that I 
have to be very careful to do a good job because uh, I wanted to reflect well on uh, women engineers, women, and I'm representing the women. And he looked at me and he says, wow, you know, it must be tough representing half of the world's population. And I realized that I actually don't personally represent half the world's population and that if I screw up, it's not really going to harm all the other women who come after me. Just relax. Just relax. Be yourself. You do well because you want to do well. And you're not actually screwing it up for anybody else. So another part of the return to graduate school was to start mindlessly following your peers. I mean that only jokingly. Um, I went to graduate school to get a master's degree, but when I got there, everybody else was doing a PhD. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe I can do that. I can do a PhD. So I stay on. It's time to graduate. You know, I was probably going to go back to government, maybe go into industry. I hadn't really thought about it too much, but everybody else around me was applying to academia. Okay, I'll apply to academia. That doesn't work out. I go back to uh, plan A, uh, government or industry. And that brings me to a little uh, sidebar. I love science fiction. And I've been a science fiction fan. Why did I end up becoming an engineer? Um, maybe it was the first science fiction novel I read about telepathy being the means of communicating across faster than light travel. Don't know. Lots of things. Uh, recently, I've uh, read my first um, Chinese science fiction books in translation. A uh, book, great book, I recommend it, called The Three-Body Problem. And a uh, little sequitur to what is my uh, last point about the experience of leaving graduate school, and that's something called not the three-body problem, but the two-body problem. The two-body problem is when you have you and your husband who is trying to find a position in hopefully the same city so that you can have a private life and a career that is interesting. So in my case, my husband is from Quebec City, and we, uh, I got a few offers from different universities, but fortunately, uh, one of them was a Canadian university where my husband was already a professor. So I ended up going to a Canadian university. And it's really interesting because I studied Spanish and German, and now I have to learn French. It's okay. That's the other uh, experience, very positive experience I had. I love traveling all over the world. I love learning uh, the culture of other people, and this was just an opportunity for me uh, to learn another one. So now we've finished with graduate school, and here we go up to l'Université Laval in Quebec City in Canada. So it's a new culture for me, a new language, a new life. Really, really exciting. I arrive at Laval University, maybe you're not so familiar with it. I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's a big university. There's um, 40 plus uh, student, 40,000 and more students. It's got a law school, it's got a med school, it's got everything you can think of, 350 different programs. It's uh, ancient, well, ex excuse me, the Europeans and the Asians in the uh, room who know what ancient really is, but in North America, it's a very old school. It was one of the second post-secondary school in all of North America, just after Harvard. It was established in 1663 as a seminary for priests and uh, recognized as a university in uh, 1852. It's got some great alumni. It's very important to the culture in Quebec, in Quebec the province, and Canada, the, the country. Three Canadian prime ministers are alumni. Uh, eight of the Quebec premiers have come from uh, Laval, 12 Supreme Court justices. It's one of the top 10 uh, universities in Canada. But what, uh, you know, that's the university, but I'll tell you what uh, I discovered and that I was not necessarily going to be aware of is that uh, this culture, work-life balance, is not a dirty word. You know, this is a place where um, family is very much respected, and I think more so than uh, most of the uh, situations I've seen in the U.S. I could be wrong, but anyway, I was um, pleasantly surprised by that discovery. So I am in the optical communications uh, group at Laval University, and uh, this is not a very big group. There's two other professors with me, uh, Sophie La Rochelle, who I have been collaborating with since our uh, mutual arrival, and some 
20 years ago. Wei Shi, a more recent uh, addition, but also uh, a great uh, collaborator. And uh, some others have gone, moved on since I first arrived, but this is where we are now. I have to say that um, I've been very lucky in the electrical engineering department at Laval University. There's only one other woman, Sophie La Rochelle. And it happened to be that we had uh, you know, mutual interests in research. We had uh, a good um, affinity to working with one another. Uh, we started co-directing our first student very uh, naturally. And from there, applied for grants, would get uh, equipment money. And we have many, many collaborations and uh, has made um, the fact of being in a minority much less visible to myself because here it is, my closest collaborator happened to be a woman. And so um, I don't know if you can plan that in your career, but you know, having some other women around really can make life more pleasant and just more uh, agreeable. So part of the, the Lunch and Learn uh, is about learning about different careers. And so I wanted to take the time to tell you what I think it's like the life of a professor. So, uh, and it's not going to be uh, sugar-coated. In fact, I have this talk when we interview uh, new professors to try and see, you know, they've applied for the position, they're clearly interested in the professor life, but I don't, I don't know if they really know what it's like. And one thing is that um, you're very isolated, and usually with a minimal support structure. Um, you come in, the chair introduces you to everyone, and you sit in your office with your new computer and no students, and you have to figure out what you're going to do. You have to invent yourself. Um, and there's not much mentoring going on. Hopefully some, but you're not guaranteed that. And if you can find one, very important, because you are going to be pretty isolated. You have, as a professor, to define your own role in research. You have to decide what's interesting, what you want to work on, where you're going to go, how you're going to do it. And some people, I've had friends who just never got into that and have left academia because they prefer the visit a job where um, the goals were set and very clear and uh, your job was to get there and not to figure out, you know, a more tenuous question, where should I be heading for? Which is maybe a, a different kind of um, personality who'd be interested in that. You have to be very resourceful. You are the one who has to find your students. You have to find your funding. You have to find your collaborators. Collaborators could be next door, uh, someone in the next department across the continent, across the, the, the globe. Who knows? Students, same thing. Uh, they're just um, not so easy to find. If you want to be a good professor, you have to be an excellent communicator, really excellent. You have to be excellent in the classroom so you can explain uh, class material. You have to be excellent at conferences so that you can explain your research, build impact, help that your research is picked up and used by others. You have to be good when you're meeting with your graduate students, coaching them, mentoring them, uh, showing them what it is you need them to do, leaving them the flexibility to discover on their own. And you have to be really good at writing grant proposal, after grant proposal, after grant proposal. So speaking, writing, organizing, uh, communication skills, uh, very important. Also as a professor, you're running a mom and pop operation. You're your own sales department, you're your own finance department, your own administration, and your own human resources. This goes back to what I said about having to find your own students, find the funding, develop collaboration. So. It uh, really requires a self-starter uh, to be uh, an effective professor. Um, I guess I should talk a little bit about tech. I'm not going to do much. I'm just going to tell you what my research topics are now. I like to look at coherent detection, looking at coding schemes and constellation optimizations when we're using coherent detection in optical environment, digital signal processing for different kinds of impairment mitigation, I uh, like to look at OFDM for optical networks. I say coherent detection, also look at that for direct detection. I like looking at radio over fiber optimization for the wireless uh, optical interface, 5G for PON, um, enabling some cloud applications. So I'm getting the uh, physical layer uh, requirements 
to meet um, software-defined network, or cloud applications, whatever you want to call it. Looking also at space division multiplexing, uh, we're designing fibers uh, for orbital angular momentum, looking at some experimental demonstrations, and uh, uh, sort of the um, impairments during propagation. I'm also looking at silicon photonics. I like to be in uh, silicon photonics is enabling different capabilities. So looking at system optimization and modeling for um, silicon photonics. I guess I should tell you, you know, sort of at the end of your career, you know, what, what can you, where have I come with my career? You know, my accomplishments. Uh, I have a Canada Research Chair. Uh, these are federally sponsored research chairs. There's about 2,000 in all fields across Canada. Uh, mine is in the Communication Systems Enabling the Clouds Fellow of uh, the OSA as of this year, as of yesterday. Uh, fellow of the IEEE. I've gotten, uh, I've been recognized by the IEEE Canada with two medals, one medal for uh, Outstanding uh, Engineering Educator and another medal for my contributions to telecommunications research. I've had a number of teaching awards for graduate supervision, uh, provincial and at the university level, and for my undergraduate course. I've been elected a member of the Board of Governors for the IEEE Photonics Society. If there's anything you don't like about it, would like improved, come see me. I've been an associate editor also for the Journal of uh, Optical Communications and Networking and Communications Letters. Um, one side uh, project was the two years that I spent at Intel. Um, it was a two-year leave of absence from the university. I established the first communications research group in what was the Intel Architecture Group, a Pentium processor, and then uh, uh, spun off into a new group which is focused on communications with senior manager in that group. I was the Intel representative to the Berkeley Wireless Research Center at UC Berkeley. I had three patents awarded, included a very broad patent on cognitive reconfigurable radio. And while I was there, I worked on ultra-wideband communications, very early application of multi-user detection to that uh, um, communications and channel sounding uh, of the 2 to 8 gigahertz bands, which were the basis for the IEEE channel models. Um, this will give you an idea of like what I'm known for, um, sort of my top 10 uh, cited articles. Many of these came from the Intel years, others uh, at Laval, a lot of CDMA uh, that you'll see in there. Of course, this is uh, type side is always dominated by older work rather than more recent work. I contribute to a lot of different venues, involves a lot of uh, travel to OFC. ECOC and many other different conferences. And I just wanted to say uh, that brings me to the third lemma of the woman engineer. One thing that's great about being a woman engineer is that you always get respect from your neighbor on the airplane. Okay, I've never uh, said to somebody, you know, get on the airplane, gotta make a little chit chat. The person next to you asks, what do you do? Oh, I'm an engineer, electrical engineer. They see a woman electrical engineer, wow. You know, nobody plays game trying to uh, outdo me. I'm not sure if be a doctor or you know, what else would be uh, as impressive. Maybe a lumberjack would really impress the woman lumberjack. But anyway, uh, it's one of the perks that uh, people don't necessarily talk about. So anyway, I was at Intel. I decided to return to academia. Why did I return? For the freedom of university life. And I put freedom in quotes because you are your own boss. That's your freedom. But you can be a very demanding boss. So it's not that work is easier, but you have a lot more control over it. And I found it easier to work, manage the work-life balance in academia than I did in the industry or certainly government. Um, leaving Intel, no more round trips, daily round trips to the next state to collaborate with the boss in uh, Portland. No more 6 a.m. phone calls to Russia or Israel. Thank God I wasn't working with China. It would have been even worse. And uh, you have almost absolute control over your ca calendar in academia. Now, almost, because you have to teach. You teach those, uh, you don't have no choice over the, the timing of that. And your child's sick, you have to find a way to get and not cancel your class. But you can pick the conferences you attend and, uh, and decide you're not going to go. You're going to send somebody else. You have, you have this control. I also miss the rhythm, the rhythm of the academic year. It's something that I... I find very pleasant uh, to be able to see 
uh, the busy times, the more quiet times, when I'm going to focus on teaching, when I'm going to focus on research. So if I'm going to end this with some advice, I'm going to tell you that my career advice is the variety is the spice of life. Branch out. Take chances. Learn something new. Take the tiger by the tail. And by that I mean don't be afraid to jump on that hot topic that everyone else is jumping on. But you have to be innovative. You have to be able to stand out from that crowd. Uh, good researchers have to be comfortable with ambiguity. They have to be able to venture out into a place that they don't know so well. Of course, you're not going to live with that ambiguity. You're going to have to try and solve it. But you have to be able to live with it, to feel comfortable with it, to be able to move in on it. And I can give you some concrete examples on how it helped me. And that was um, optics versus wireless. Um, the opportunity, I had the two-body problem. Uh, we were trying to find a position at uh, the same university and at Laval University. They had an opening in optics. They didn't have an opening in wireless. And so I had to step up to the plate and go with the strength of my um, knowledge in the systems of communications and which would shift from focusing on wireless to focusing on optics. And it was an adjustment, but it was a very successful one and a very invigorating one. Uh, theory versus experimental. I was completely theoretical before I arrived at uh, uh, Laval University, despite having changed the clutch on my own car. I um, hadn't really done any experimental work in uh, communications and uh, experimental research in communications. And it was at Laval University, this was a big tradition, it was the experimental side. And so uh, I jumped on that, grabbed that tiger by the tail, and it has uh, served me well. And uh, by the spice of life, I mean, uh, you have to nurture a mix of expertise in your team. And so that means uh, being able to communicate with people um, outside, branching out, getting variety, because you may have a certain expertise, but you're part of a team, and you've got to interact, and you've got to learn about the other aspects of that team's uh, problem. So this is just a little uh, cloud of the different uh, keywords from my publications, and you can maybe get a feeling for the variety that I've had to embrace in uh, looking out. Uh, you can see optical has become uh, very big but you'll also see some wireless uh, keywords in there. Collaborations, uh, maybe this is the last word. Um, this is a list of all the co-authors of my publications. And I can see my colleague, Sophie La Rochelle's name is coming up very big because we have an immense number of uh, uh, publications in common, which I think is a big strength for our, our group. So the last lemma of the woman engineer, your best work may have nothing to do with tech. And that's because it's the people you grow with. You know, I've had um, some 40-plus uh, students graduate with me, plus postdocs. They've been placed at universities uh, all over, research labs, industry all over the world. And you know, this is an accomplishment. It's not just the research or the publications. It's um, the colleagues that we work with, whether it's uh, uh, academic or here, the group I worked with in, in uh, Intel. And here's the certain newest cohort uh, students I'm working with now, and you know, not just interacting on the research level, but I get to teach some of these foreign students about baseball. So, very satisfying. So, thank you for your attention. And, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.